And hello and welcome to this, the ninth in the series, Considerations and Strategies for Running Clinical Trials During the COVID Pandemic. My name is Jenny Dyer and I'm the CEO of ARCS. So today we will hear from Jennifer Hertz, who's the Managing Director of Biointellect, uh, Dr. Gary Groman, the, a consultant with environmental pathogens in Canberra uh, and a board member director of the Immunisation Coalition. And uh, finally, Professor Jennifer Martin, a chair of clinical pharmacology at the University of Newcastle. So before, um, so I guess before I go on, the future, um, will we have a vaccine? We know how important this is for all of us. Uh, it's the panacea that will allow us to get back to normal human interactions, confidence back into the economy and the community. But when and how, we'll get it. Our speakers today will share their insights and updates. But firstly, to our sponsors. So as I've said previously, we're very grateful to MTP Connect and to the New South Wales Health who've come on board to sponsor this series. It's been fantastic for us, and I think also for you guys. Um, again, just our volunteer program, um, we thank Queensland Health um, uh, and New South Wales Health Force for uh, sponsoring this program to provide much needed help uh, at sites where um, COVID was uh, an, an issue and also to help with those, those st COVID studies where people needed assistance. So thank you to all those people who volunteered um, and we're very grateful. So just getting on to um, some of the uh, housekeeping, um, as you know, we record these sessions, so, so please don't uh, do your own recording. Um, some of the journal data has only been released uh, as of last week um, that will be referenced uh, by the presenters today. We've applied to the journals for access and waiting to hear back. Um, if this is not received, we will uh, either delay publication or publish uh, redacted recordings. Um, we note uh, our audience today is an internal group for, this, uh, for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, again, as you know, um, where possible, if you could reserve your questions until the end, um, but please use the chat function and log your questions so we know what, what's coming up um, there. Uh, as we've said before, um, the information that we're providing um, is more specific to our sector, um, but uh, for, for full and further updates, please go to uh, health.gov.au. Uh, that's the, the site for um, uh, all recent uh, information. So again, um, we're nearly to the end of the series. I can't believe that uh, it's nearly, well, it's, it's over nine weeks because uh, we had a break over Easter and, and uh, the holidays, but uh, um, this is the second last in the series, uh, and um, yeah, it's very, very sad to say that we're, we're nearly finished. Um, again, um, ARCS, um, who, who are we? Um, ARCS, as you know, a professional body representing your interests relevant to stakeholders and providing professional development and career pathways. Uh, membership is due up in uh, in July, so if you're a me if you are a current member, don't forget to renew in July. If you're not a member, um, please uh, go to our website and consider um, joining up. We do these types of activities and much much more. So to our uh, our, our speakers for today, um, as I said, we have Jennifer Hertz, Gary Groman, and Jennifer M uh, Martin. Um, our first speaker uh, today is, uh, is uh, Jennifer Hertz. Uh, Jen uh, is the founder of a company called Biointellect. She founded that in 2011 to provide strategic commercialisation services to the biopharmaceutical industry. She has over 20 years commercial business uh, development and scientific affairs experience in the biopharm uh, industry and has held a variety of roles with responsibility in Australia, New Zealand, Europe and international markets. She was the first managing director of Sanofi Pasteur in Australia, which was then a startup company and grew significantly over six years of her tenure um, uh, in Australia. She's previously been a board member of Medicines Australia, where she led industry discussions with government uh, related to new funding arrangements with vaccines. Uh, on the PBAC. So Jen, I'm going to hand it over to you now uh, and uh, thank you for your presentations. 
Thanks, Shani, for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm not going to talk directly about clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines, which will be covered by another speaker. Instead, I'm going to set the scene for some of the challenges we face, particularly in Australia, to actually secure access to a vaccine. At BioIntellect, we work across the life sciences sector with universities, research institutes, biotech and medtech companies, as well as major pharmaceutical companies, both in Australia and overseas. This gives us a unique 360 degree view of the ecosystem. We currently have six clients with COVID-19 technologies and over the last eight years, we've completed multiple vaccine projects for many different vaccines at all stages of development from preclinical right through to post-market. Next slide, please. You will have all read many articles about the various vaccines in development for COVID-19 and seen regular updates in the media. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, has stepped up to provide significant funding and technological support for the most promising candidates. This summary from an article published in May demonstrates the variety of different vaccine types that are under development on the right-hand side. The World Health Organization also has a COVID-19 vaccine landscape, which is regularly updated, and that shows that there are now 11 vaccines in phase one clinical trials. Two overseas companies have already started their trials in Australia, Novavax and Clover Biopharmaceuticals, and of course, there are local vaccine candidates soon to start trials coming from the University of Queensland. The CSIRO, through its Centre for Disease Preparedness, has partnered with CEPI to provide a preclinical ferret model on which to test selected COVID-19 vaccines. So at the basic research, preclinical and phase one clinical stage, Australia is punching above its weight. Next slide, please. This slide depicts typical vaccine development in a linear fashion and highlights some of the considerations from the regulatory perspective. The regulator has to approve the manufacturing site as well as the manufacturing process. And the clinical trials need to be conducted with materials that are manufactured in that site using a specific process and specific cell line. So you can see that manufacturing is defined early in the development process. Next slide, please. So also thinking about typical linear vaccine product development, you can see here the probability of success at each stage of development. If you multiply these out, you have a cumulative success rate of 12.5%. Another article published by a group in the Netherlands, which reviewed over 600 vaccine R&D projects in development over a 10 year period, concluded that the chance of successful market entry for a preclinical candidate prophylactic viral vaccine is 6%. Next slide, please. A review in vaccine looked at the length of time for each stage of development and compared vaccines for pharmaceuticals. The overall development time from preclinical through to market authorization was over 14 years for vaccines compared to 12.7 years for pharmaceuticals. There are similar studies by Vaccines Europe thinking about market access delays between vaccines and pharmaceuticals. In a pandemic situation, of course, the traditional health technology assessment process may not apply, but planning for supply chain, development of the immunization strategy and implementation of any vaccine program will also delay access. Australia's public health response has been excellent compared to some countries, but we will more than likely rely on a vaccine manufactured overseas. Although, of course, since this talk, it has been announced by Securus that they are partnering to manufacture the vaccine made by the University of Queensland. Next slide, please. Vaccine manufacturing is long and complex. Production times typically take from several months in the case of influenza vaccine and up to three years for more complex vaccines like hexavalent pediatric combination vaccines. There is a lot of complexity and variability in the biological process. There are multiple steps in, involved in purification and quality verification to ensure safety. Each vaccine will have unique testing and release specifications to confirm purity, safety, efficacy, and stability. Obviously, there are shelf life considerations. Usually vaccines have a shelf life of between one and three years, 
and requirements to prove the cold chain during shipping. Um, and finally, the vaccine must be in a suitable presentation for implementation in the population. Typically in Australia, we use pre-filled syringes with a specific needle size in single and multiple packs. So securing supply of those materials is also important, although some of those requirements for presentation may be waived in an emergency. Next slide, please. So we talked about CEPI and their support for vaccine development, and they're really challenging the traditional vaccine development paradigms. Their model anticipated that they would develop stockpiles of vaccines after phase 2A trials, expecting that they would undergo clinical trials during future outbreaks. In addition, CEPI will support development of platform technologies that could be adapted to, for example, disease X and be ready for emerging infectious diseases. The University of Queensland's molecular clamp technology is one such platform. So developing a vaccine in a pandemic situation will mean that multiple activities are started in parallel and at risk. Additional clinical trial material will be being manufactured before the results of phase one trials are known. Investment in manufacturing scale up, considerations around possible tech transfer with the associated process development will also be necessary to ensure that large quantities of vaccine are available. We don't yet know which platforms will be scalable or which vaccines will be effective. Next slide, please. So thinking about supply, let's consider Australia's situation compared to the rest of wor the world. Our only domestic manufacturer is Securus, who manufacture a seasonal and pandemic influenza vaccines, as well as Q-fever vaccines in Australia. They have significant capability and capacity and were the first company to supply H1N1 vaccines to Australians in the 2009 pandemic. Up until now, their domestic capability has been restricted to egg-based vaccine manufacture. But of course, there's been a recent announcement about their partnership with the University of Queensland um, and their capacity to also manufacture a recombinant protein vaccine should that vaccine candidate um, show that it's uh, suitable. So often the bottlenecks in vaccine production relate to fill and finish. In the Northern Hemisphere, the US government have invested significantly in a fill finish manufacturing network to address this and secure supply for the US. A similar initiative, albeit on a smaller scale, could permit Australia to import bulk vaccine for the local population. Next slide, please. In Europe, after the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, the European Council requested the Commission to start the preparation of joint procurement initiatives to procure vaccines in the context of the future pandemic. These provisions were finalised in 2013. As of March this year, the joint procurement article has been signed by 26 countries, including the UK, and will cover around 440 million people in Europe, which is about 98% of the population in the European Union. This joint procurement agreement defines the decision-making process as well as establishing the tender and the contract award. So there's now been a global collaboration called ACT to accelerate the development, production and equitable access to new COVID-19 diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. It's still unclear how this, is, how this will work and where Australia will sit in that priority list. Next, next slide, please. So thinking about creative ways to boost supply, this is a really interesting case study showing how Roche outsourced manufacturing to ensure sufficient availability for Tamiflu in the case of the flu pandemic. In the early 2000s, Roche invested in increased production capacity to support stockpiling activities and increase their capacity from 10 million up to 40 million courses. In October 2005, which some of you may recall was when avian influenza emerged and many countries began, began stockpiling H5N1 um, vaccine for pandemic flu, Roche issued an open invitation to third parties that would be interested in becoming involved in a TAMI flu manufacturing um, global supply network. And all in or up, they've secured 18 external partners in 10 different locations around the world who collaborate as part of this um, Tamiflu supply chain network. Through outsourced manufacturing of the drug to third parties, Roche has, can now produce up to 400 million treatment courses of Tamiflu if required. 
Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I think these examples highlight that Australia needs to do more to bridge the gap between early stage product development and commercial scale manufacturing. We are a sophisticated country with excellent research capability and a leading regulatory authority, but our geographical location and small population size does leave us vulnerable if we rely on imported products. There's an urgent need to map Australia's vaccine development and supply chain con capability quantify these gaps and identify where we're most at risk. And then we need to find innovative solutions. Scientists need to work with industry to ensure that government invests strategically to address those gaps. Given our location, it seems logical that we could be a regional supply hub for some products which would address needs of our more vulnerable neighbours, as well as improve sustainability. We could also identify um, innovative ways to have contracts for bulk supply with overseas manufacturers that would help secure access to a COVID-19 vaccine. COVID-19 has created an opportunity to advocate for this and hopefully secure additional investment from government and additional interest from all stakeholders. So that concludes my talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jen. Um, and that was a great summary and, and probably a wake-up call for us that, that um, we need to ensure that when a vaccine is uh, you know, made available that we've got the, the capability and capacity to, to do some form of manufacturing uh, here in Australia to get access to it. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr Gary Groman. Um, Gary uh, is a vir virologist and former director of immunobiology, uh, a WHO essential regulatory laboratory. Um, at the TGA in, uh, in Australia uh, between 1997 and 2015 uh, was responsible for vaccine testing and registration. Uh, during this time, he also represented the TGA on various uh, WHO committees involve, involved uh, in producing um, influenza and issues related to that. Uh, he then undertook a number of engagements with the World Health Organization uh, in Geneva with the Health Systems and Innovation Group, uh, working with the Tech Transfer Initiative, assisting developing vaccine manufacturers and the World Health Organization Research Blueprint, the Global Action Plan for Influenza Vaccines, the Essential Medicines Program, uh, reviewing biocontainment, and the Global Influenza Program, that's Vaccine Strain Selection Committee, and the switch meetings uh, and the pandemic influenza preparedness framework review group secretariat lead. Um, Gary, I think is in a good position to uh, to talk to us today about what we need to be looking at uh, in relation to the preparation of a COVID uh, vaccine. Thank you, Gary. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. If I could have the first slide. It's uh, just a title slide. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was the status of the current vaccines for COVID and the implications for Australia, uh, which Jenny has really already covered. So I'm mainly going to talk about the vaccines themselves. Next slide, thanks. So apart from uh, all the work that's been done on the ground so far, all the wonderful interventions like social distancing, border control, hygiene, education, and so on, uh, which seem to have really worked for Australia for sure. Uh, there are many other moving parts, and I've got a whole list of them there, and I won't touch on all of them. But I wanted to say that 90% of these are simply unknown. We do have GizAid and other databases that are very effective in collecting COVID data when it's uploaded, but nearly everything else on here is a little bit of a question mark. There's much we don't know how any of this is really going to unfold. Now, that, of course, hasn't stopped people from making vaccines, if I could have the next slide. So despite many unknowns, people have certainly started to make vaccines. And uh, as you probably know, in May um, this year, WHO listed over 124 groups working on vaccine candidates. One point I'll make about vaccine candidates is that they're not vaccines. They are just that, vaccine candidates. And vaccines, as Jenny has explained, is a whole different ball game, uh, reliant on GMP, very fickle, but definite quality control uh, processes, manufacturing processes that are really important 
that finally bring a vaccine all together. And the other thing to remember for any vaccine, the part on the left, um, which I've just taken from nature, just simply explains that, yes, we do need not only the antibody response, we also need CTL response for a vaccine to be effective. You can't really have one or the other, uh, otherwise the vaccine won't be terribly effective. And that I think is quite important for any vaccine approach. So the array of vaccines that we have, uh, the virus itself, whether it be attenuated or inactivated, the viral ve vector approach, whether it's replicating or non-replicating, the nucleate, nucleic acid approach, whether it's a DNA or RNA, messenger RNA vaccine, and the protein-based protein subunits and virus-like particles. By far the greatest numbers in the protein-based group, particularly protein subunit, there's also um, quite a few in the messenger RNA group. Uh, if I could have the next slide, thanks. So uh, if we take uh, virus vaccines, uh, um, if, if we take the inactivated and the attenuated, some of the issues that might arise are that the attenuated virus may mutate and reassort. So there is a safety question there that needs to be investigated uh, and presented to regulators and so on. High titers of virus might be required for inactivated vaccine, and that's usually the case. There hopefully will be a way to dose spare, for example, use the adjuvant, and if we're lucky, a lower dose um, may prove to be fortuitous, so we don't really need a high dose. But that the question of dose is important because manufacturing uh, then um, uh, is affected and, and released to the community. Um, it is unproven, it's unlicensed, and the production capacity, we just don't know. And, we also, and that will also be determined by the dose as well. Next slide, thanks. So when it comes to nucleic acid-based vaccines, again, they're unproven in humans. Um, none of them are licensed. Um, scale up is a question. How much can be produced? Uh, the safety and long-term effects are entirely unknown. And there's a little bullet point there called public acceptance. I do wonder, um, you know, whether it'll pass the pub test, whether uh, people in the community will be accepting of DNA and RNA vaccines. So some education might need uh, to happen there for these vaccines to be accepted. For the DNA vaccines, there's the issue of potential integration into the human gene and poor immunogenicity in humans, although reasonably successful in primates. And for messenger RNA vaccines, there's concerns with instability and also low immunogenicity. Next slide, thanks. So with the protein-based vaccines for COVID, uh, again, they're unproven, uh, but certainly uh, there's quite a number of companies going in this direction. Uh, production capacity is also an issue. For the protein and adjuvant will almost certainly be needed and likely multiple doses. For virus-like particles, stability is often an issue and they're very difficult to manufacture and the quality control of them is, is also quite tricky. The next slide, thanks. So for viral vectored vaccines, uh, these are delivered by other viruses so, such as adenovirus, for example, or sometimes lentiviruses. Uh, one of the issues could be pre-existing immunity to a particular vector, which might give, in fact, a poor response. Several doses might be required, and you might develop immunity to the vector anyway, uh, rendering the vaccine useless. I know that um, uh, there have been many papers on the use of adenovirus, but uh, none of them have really translated into a vaccine uh, to date. Nevertheless, uh, people are trying this approach. Uh, which is well and good and safety of the vector is also important, let alone the delivery package. Next slide, thanks. So just a few key issues with Jenny has really covered already uh, on vaccine design and production. There's a whole lot of unknowns. We don't know the amount of antigen that might be needed or the dose or the number of doses. We don't know whether boosters will be needed late, later. We have no idea of the actual correlate of protection, although we may have a marker, but that's not necessarily a correlate. All that needs to be elucidated. How do you lot release? That's, the regulators will be asking that question. Um, and then safety and particularly long-term safety of adverse reactions needs to be established. 
Then there are some very practical things like shelf life, stability data, GMP is a given, that has to happen. But remember, candidate virus vaccines made by research group are the first step in a GMP process. So there needs to be at least excellent GLP. Adventitious agents could be an issue and that needs to be investigated and eliminated as a problem. Uh, production capacity, commercial partnerships are necessary almost certainly uh, between various companies uh, to be able to provide the vaccine. Uh, adjuvants where used, the safety of them needs to be determined. Um, some manufacturers don't have much experience with COVID. In fact, very few have got any experience with COVID, let alone a platform. So that will also be a factor. And then clinical trial capacity and experience will also be an important factor. All these issues, certainly uh, you know, these things don't happen quickly or overnight and may well delay um, uh, the final delivery of a vaccine. Next slide, thanks. So despite um, all these challenges, um, there are further issues with virus safety and immune response. Uh, so virus mutation and evolution, um, it's probable the vaccines are likely to be partially effective. Uh, endpoints in phase three studies need to be clear. Uh, immune responses need to be determined and understood, and they're going to vary for each platform. And then there are some other more specific safety issues like immune complex formation, the adjuvant, complement and or macrophage activation and inflammatory cytokines, any allergic inflammation, and FC mediated increase in viral entry. So all these things also need to be determined, preferably in the research stage before we uh, move into a vaccine. Next slide, thanks. So despite all of these uh, impending challenges, there are around about 11 or 12 vaccines um, that are moving into phase one clinical trials or expected to move into these uh, trials shortly. But none of these vaccines are really expected to reach the market for one to two years. And you can see there on the slide, the RNA vaccine, non-replicating vector DNA with electroporation, inactivated and protein subunits are all well represented by different groups. And we've heard in the news about Moderna, University of Oxford, uh, Novavax, uh, some of the uh, groups in China as well. So these are all moving forward into clinical trials and we're all keeping our fingers crossed that things will go well in the phase one clinical trial. So next slide, thanks. So I wanted to mention um, some docking studies. We don't really know if any of these vaccines will be successful and there's further potential issues with vaccines uh, in that there may be more than one receptor site. And there's a group called ABM in the States that has been studying this using uh, uh, the ClusPro software, and they're also using Rosetta. And what they've found is that looking at uh, the various molecular interactions and attractions, whether they're electrostatic or van der Waals forces or hydrophobic, whatever they may, whatever they may be, there are other receptor sites uh, that are as attractive as ACE2 when it comes to COVID-19. So this unfortunately might mean that our vaccines, which are aiming at ACE2, may not be as effective as we think. And the obvious example is HIV vaccine, which failed ter terribly because everybody thought it only had one receptor site at CD4. And it turned out to have quite a few. This is another big unknown that some people are studying and something that really needs to be elucidated and may well uh, impede the success of a future vaccine. And last slide, I think. Next slide, thanks. So, oh, sorry, there's one more before that. I wanted to, um, sorry, if you just go back one, I just wanted to talk about, even though we're concentrating on vaccines and this is not really part of the uh, process, uh, there are other treatments. Just one more slide, thanks. There are other treatments um, that could be looked at, that could be used immediately, and some authors have called them products in, in plain sight. And some of these are things like the AVM group are using repurposed dexamethasone, um, which seems to supercharge natural killer cells, cytotoxic T cells, and dendritic cells. And it has FDA approval now for compassionate use and use of malignancies. And there's a group in Germany using it on COVID patients with success. 
Uh, NIH is looking at anticoagulants and that seems to have some success. Other groups are looking at various hormones in, in addition with other things like vitamin C, thiamine and heparin. That seems to be having some success as well. Antivirals are not having much success. Antimalarials are entirely unproven and statins, although not useful alone, appear to have some success together with ARBs. And there's plenty of anecdotal reports showing success in that area. And the last slide, just a few conclusions. Um, that firstly, the COVID-19 may not be successful. I think we all have to be prepared for that. Protection may be partial. Um, both arms have to be activated. Antibody markers are interesting, but they're not a correlate of protection and we need to do more work in that area, I feel. Um, Australia has no COVID manufacturing capacity. Uh, we do have full finish, as Jenny explained. We'll probably need a variety of platforms uh, to be able to fill out supply orders for everybody. Um, and partnerships are obviously going to be needed between manufacturers and in between nations and so on. That's going to be essential for, um, for reliable production. Um, we know vaccines are essential, particularly against further waves of infection. Uh, there are still safety and production concerns, and there has been some success with these other interventions, but that's for immediate use, not for uh, the long-term use. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, Gary. Um, it's, it's all pretty scary, really. I get <laughs> anyway, um, we can only do what we can do, but um, look, at, uh, thank you for that. Our final uh, speaker for today um, now is uh, Professor Jenny Martin. Um, Jenny is a dual trained clinical pharmacologist and physician and chair of the discipline of clinical pharmacology in the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Um, she's also director of the NHMRC funded Australia Centre for Oh, cannabinoid Clinical and Research Excellence, Australia's first federally funded research centre on medicinal cannab... Oh, why are they difficult words, Jen? Um, cannabinoids <laughs> to ensure quality, <laughs> safety and implementation of medicinal cannabis, I can say that one, um, using the community as well, Director of the Centre for Drug Repurposing and Medicines Research. Jen's going to be talking about some of the work that she's been doing most recently in the COVID space. Thank you, Jen, for those big words. Thank you very much, Shani. And I would just like to say that um, that art's been very helpful um, to us in our pursuit of repurposed drugs in, in COVID. Um, and I'm actually really happy to um, to come today and just to talk about um, uh, overcoming one of those barriers that we have in clinical research, um, but also to maybe uh, if an opportunity comes down the track when we've got some data to to present that. Um, so I'm a physician um, at the John Hunter, and I was involved. Uh, on the front line when we had our first lot of patients that came into hospital and I guess that um, what we really saw was that um, people didn't really die of the virus, that people were getting the virus and clearing it. What was actually causing people to get really unwell and to go to ICU was actually the fact um, of the host response to the virus. So it was how the body um, actually uh, became uh, pro-inflammatory, cytokine release, um, angiotensin switched on, uh, a, a, a thrombotic process switched on, and these are the things that are actually causing our end organ dysfunction. And I think that we thought, well, as pharmacologists, what can we do that contributes to the space? Uh, obviously, we're not uh, vaccine um, specialists, we're not immunologists, um, and we know that social distancing definitely works for this virus, so I think that that's one um, avenue that we can go down to contain the virus um, and obviously a vaccine would be absolutely um, perfect as well because it would stop people getting the virus but knowing that people don't like social distancing knowing as you've already heard um, from Jennifer and Gary that these vaccines are a long time away um, what options have we got for treating the host response to this virus for those really sick people who come to hospital so not for people in the community that deal with this virus like they do with influenza and get unwell for two weeks, which is which is bad enough. Um, but really, uh, those patients that actually come to hospital are very sick, half of whom um, uh, go to ICU and half of those people who unfortunately pass away. Um, so it's where we really thought we uh, could make a difference. And so we looked at the major responses of the host to this virus and started to look at drugs that we already had in our cabinet that we could give to patients. 
And we knew that there were people already looking at blocking the cytokine response. And we've heard from Gary some of those studies about steroids, um, been a few others with drugs that block um, some of the cytokine pathways like interleukin-6. Um, but about 20 years ago, I actually did a PhD in Melbourne in the Baker on statins and angiotensin blockers. And I know what they do. Um, and that organization has spent probably 30 years at that point already looking at this pathway and uh, where you could actually switch it off. So we became quite keen on looking at this, particularly as the information was coming out of China showing that people that passed away actually had very high levels of this hormone called angiotensin. And it almost seemed too good to be true to be thinking, well, we've already got drugs that block this pathway. Um, we know what this pathway does. We know that it's critical in a host response to, to a virus. Um, from work that's been done with angiotensin and other viruses like influenza, particularly when that's caused an influenza lung and people have gone to, to hospital with that. So what we did was to include people that had been working in the area for a long time um, outside of, uh, of New South Wales, so in Victoria and Adelaide. Um, some people have been working on the angiotensin pathway since the early 80s um, and started to look at whether we thought this would actually be a useful armamentarium for, um, for clinicians looking after patients in the hospital. And as we were doing that, there was increasing numbers of retrospective studies that were coming out of China from the UK, from Imperial, from Minnesota and the US, uh, showing that patients that were actually taking these drugs actually had a lowered mortality. So that was quite consistent with the, the physiology and the pathophysiology and also the known physiology uh, pharmacology of these drugs. So we sort of became quite excited by that. And uh, also we were lucky enough because these drugs have been around for so long that we knew what doses were registered, what doses were harmful, what doses caused toxicity. Uh, admittedly in the diabetes and the hypertension area, um, but there was actually quite a lot of data supporting the registration of those drugs by the TGA with higher doses. So we knew that even if we needed to get the dose higher to switch off a much more significant activation of the renin system than what we get in hypertension, that we knew how high we could go without causing toxicity. So all of that information was actually really, really helpful. It saved us about 15 years of drug development um, and we felt pretty comfortable that we knew that we could use some of these drugs. We know what the toxicity profile was and what the, the starting dose um, should be. The problem was we really needed to do a randomized control study for this. And we didn't really know the best dose to use for efficacy in this condition. Uh, so what we realized we needed to do was to do a pharmacology study, a dose finding study, um, to do some pharmacokinetics, um, some some other pharmacology work just to get information about that to really power a bigger a much bigger study um, and this is where we met our first barrier uh, well actually probably our biggest barrier and that was that we we're already doing all this cannabis work so drug development around that around trying to get these drugs these these molecules licensed and we didn't really have any spare capacity um, Actually, I was pretty much, we were, we were all flogging ourselves and each other to get this cannabis work out, and there really was no spare capacity. But we were absolutely committed to, to doing a clinical trial, um, and we wanted to get some support to do that. In our organisation, we had already committed to running a study of hydroxychloroquine, and therefore we had no clinical trial support staff, no management, no infrastructure, no, no funding. Um, and none of our staff really wanted to also compete with this study for a study of an angiotensin drug. So we're really pretty, pretty stuck. But I think we were convinced firstly that hydroxychloroquine didn't work and also just on basic pharmacological principles. And, we've, and there was also a number of studies out there showing that it actually didn't cause any efficacy. Um, it just caused significant toxicity. So we felt we, we sort of held, held the moral high ground but also the academic high ground. And we felt that we really should push this, um, this area. So we approached New South Wales Health, who put us in touch uh, with Shani and her team. Um, and we were very fortunate to be put in touch with one of the volunteers on this program, the ARCS Volunteer Pro uh, Clinical Trial Program, and got support to um, actually put a protocol together for a clinical trial that would be applicable for an ethics committee. Um, and that person, person was Kathleen Irish, um, who helped us actually write the protocol, checked on the um, 
all of the infrastructure that we needed to have for good clinical practice to make sure we ran the trial properly um, and also helped us with getting ethics approval um, through Bilberry, which meant that we could run the study outside our own little health district. Um, so all of that has been absolutely fantastic and we're completely surprised um, that we could actually even get to the stage. Um, so we have got a protocol um, up and um, that's in the process of being registered on the trial site. We do have to complete our ethics application um, and we're just waiting to hopefully get some funding from New South Wales Health um, to provide a statistician to check some of our uh, mathematical assumptions around the dosing and around the sample size. So I guess what I'm saying is that, um, I, well, I, I'm overwhelmed with um, gratitude, I think, to ARCS and to New South Wales Health for supporting what was really, um, I think, a, a, just a good idea, but it actually was backed with a lot of, I mean, a huge amount of evidence and work. Um, we were lucky that we actually got it published in the MJA. It actually hasn't come out in paper form, but um, we've had some publications on this area um, which have been peer reviewed. And so we know that the idea is pretty, pretty good. Um, I guess that uh, we are thinking that we want to make sure that any trials going forward are really based on sound physiology, sound pathophysiology and sound pharmacology. So we don't repeat the issues around doing studies with hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir and ritonavir, um, which sounded good, but actually the pharmacology wasn't really all that sound. And um, we actually spent quite a lot of time and energy in the country just pushing some studies forward, um, really, that I think could have had some pharmacology input into them. I guess the other thing is we do have limited resource in the country. And in the past, um, some of our research has been really focused on the organisation. Um, and we've, we've kind of been in silos also, not just organisational wise, but in pharmacology silos versus the physiology group silo versus an immunology silo. And I think that if we were starting again, it would be really nice to actually have these sort of discussions up front and say, okay, what strengths have we got in Australia? You know, where, where's our pharmacologists? Where are our immunologists? Uh, where are our clinical trial expertise? Where's our dosing knowledge? Where's our clinical trial support for investigated initiated studies? Um, because I think that this has been uh, this has been become quite evident really for us uh, through our process and just really aware of the fact that you could have a really good idea um, and very scientifically focused and 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 that, but actually uh, trying to get a, above a political process or the standard you know, university clinical trial research pathway had been actually quite difficult. So anyway, we, we haven't got any data for you. I, I, I hope that our study is, help, is helpful. Um, I'll be looking pretty dumb otherwise, I think, if it comes out of it. <laughs> but really, we spent a huge amount of time um, getting the dose right for, for, for a dose finding study and I feel pretty comfortable about it, but it was really just to say thank you um, to ARCS and hopefully, um, you know, if I can maybe put in a more diplomatic way going forward, we might be able to think about pulling people together um, up front to think of national clinical trials that are in the national interest with the huge amounts of expertise that we've got around Australia in little pockets. Um, and I say that because I'm in Newcastle and people might forget that we're there, but um, there's actually some incredible um, research going on in some of the smaller places as well. So that's really all I want to say, but thank you very much, Shani, for your support on this and um, happy to ask questions, yep. Yeah, look, fantastic, Jen, and thank, thanks for the, the plug, but uh, you know, it was a it was a conversation, a email trail over a weekend, you know, some six or seven weeks ago that, that all this came about. I'm going, yeah, of course, let's do it, let's do it. And and, and the, the thing is that we had over 140 people uh, put their hand up to help, not, not in a paid sense, but in a in a in a in a true volunteer way that they just said, "I'd oh, volunteer." You know, I'm working full time, but I can work weekends, um, and and that just made me feel so fantastic that that people in our community just put their hand up. And then when I spoke to Kath Ira, she was, "Yeah, let's do it. Let's I can do that in my sleep." <laughs> it was just such a fantastic response, and and I and I just it makes me realise why I work in this sector with you guys uh, because uh, there's just so much goodwill there that I, I just love it. So look, enough of me. Um, I just thank you so much to our three, three presenters today. We have now, let me just put it over to the next slide uh, for questions uh, and I'll, I'll, I won't make any, any put, make any sort of funny questions about Donald Trump's uh, versions of, of vaccines or cures. 
I just understood that was a given. Um, and then we'll go on to the real questions um, and I'll hand over to Sue Mason to triage the questions. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Shani. I have one question here for Jenny Hurt. This is a great presentation and clearly shows Australia could be a vaccine manufacturing destination. How do we get the Department of Health involved? It was a shame we had to send the Gardasil manufacturing off site. Let's not see this happen again. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think part of, the, part of the challenge is probably education about the complexity of um, product development and manufacture. Um, the government's made significant investments in innovation with um, various biotech funds through the NHMRC, through the MRFF, and there's some great initiatives that are all stimulating basic research. But we really have a gap in product development and manufacturing, and that's what I was trying to highlight that. So I think this, the first step is to educate people so they understand pro complex product development and where the gaps are. And that's why I was recommending that some kind of audit of capability and gap analysis would be a great place to start. Um, but beyond that, obviously, um, I, I think it really calls upon the sector to work together uh, more than it does. I mean, we I don't think Australia does as well as some countries in terms of um, industry and academic collaborations. And maybe uh, we have that opportunity now with um, this sort of unprecedented level of collaboration that's happening with COVID-19. And um, on the one hand, yes, it, it's perhaps a little bit sobering for some of us hearing these talks that we might not be in the best position to have a vaccine in Australia. On the other hand, um, there's nothing like the present to stimulate this discussion and make sure it gets the attention it deserves in the future. Thanks, Jenny. There's another question. What is the likelihood that we will see a revamped high-tech biotech manufacturing industry in Australia? Um, well, that's a good question. I, look, I think, um, I think the stage is quite well set for biotech to grow. I mean, certainly um, the biotech industry is more buoyant than it was probably five to 10 years ago. Um, and if we can address those, those product development gaps I've talked about, that's gonna benefit everybody, not just in the vaccine sector, but um, you know, in New South Wales in particular, there's been huge leaps forward in stimulating um, initiatives from government for medical devices. And, and that's been fantastic to see. We now need to do the same with drugs, biologics and vaccines. Thanks, Jenny. And then just a couple of actual comments here to, to thank you, Shani, and to thank the presenters for absolutely fantastic presentations today with really great information that's been shared um, in, to, in the community. Oh, there's a, now I've got a question for Jennifer Martin. Your study sounds really interesting and great. You pushed to get it up and running. Given the small number and hopefully remaining small cases in Australia, are you looking for some overseas collaborators where case numbers are higher? Yes, um, for, we, um, we think we just want to do a dose finding study to start with because in the process of trying to get this up, I spoke to um, renal and cardiology groups in Australia and New Zealand. Um, who actually were coming to the same idea themselves, but they were looking at uh, a randomised control study and they just wanted to know um, the dose that, that we were using. Um, we, we think we only need about 36 patients um, for this, um, but actually uh, a, a Bayesian statistician um, who we're trying to get some funding for to help us with this, uh, thinks that as the data is coming out of uh, the US and the UK, because also in the meantime, this group in Minnesota has started a randomised control study. It's slightly different to us, but they've chosen a dose that probably is too low, um, but their information will probably help us cut out a couple of dose levels. Um, so I think that, uh, that that's really helpful. Um, and there, we just wanted to see how we could use some of the other control groups in these studies to reduce the numbers that we needed. but. Um, certainly the, we're talking with a group at King's, we're talking with this group in Minnesota, um, and uh, we just want to make sure that we don't do any more patient studies than what we need. Um, but we think that ours is probably quite a small, quite unique study, and it would be very helpful for these other groups um, to be able to use that data to go forward. But yeah, definitely. So on our group, it's a New South Wales um, group of clinicians in ICU and general medicine, and infectious diseases, but we've actually included um, a couple of 
uh, South Australian sites as well. They haven't got any patients at the moment and because of the funding requests in New South Wales Health, they won't be coming on at this stage. It would only be if we needed uh, patients down the track. But yeah, it's a very good question. And I think that competition point about the trials is, is very important. Maybe I didn't cover that very well, but you don't really want a whole lot of studies competing for patients. Um, you really want to do get one trial up and get it done well. So I, th I think that's why this national coordination is, is so important. Um, but yeah, hopefully I've answered your question. Mm. Yeah, no, look, that, I, I think, if I can I jump in and, and maybe ask some questions as well, because I think, um, you know, there's a number of important issues here. You know, one is certainly that national coordination um, of activities across Australia. I mean, we, you know, there is a fair amount of competition, you know, across the, the country, but um, this is something that I think we all need to, to be, a, you know, putting our, our, our weight behind. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the chances of us, if, if there is in the future a, a successful vaccine, what's the chances of us getting any of those doses, um, you know, where will we be in the, in the, you know, in the, in the, the feeding chain of, of, of um, recipients of a vaccine in the future? Probably a Jen or, or a Gary, maybe question. Gary, you go first, because people have heard from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suspect we'll be very low on the food chain, to be honest, unless um, uh, there's cooperation or contracts or agreements put in place now. It's reasonable to, to assume that if, say, the vaccine's made in the UK or the US or Europe, that will probably go there first. And I don't think that's an unreasonable assumption. Um, so uh, that's where most of it will go to start with. And I think other countries outside of that sphere will be low, lower down on the chain. It's the same with Japan and China if they start making the vaccine as well. That's why I think it needs a global approach that There'll be many manufacturers and many platforms involved to be able to make enough quantity of vaccine for for everyone. And then there's a the difficulty who, who gets it first. And then even within each country, who gets it first? You know, do you go for healthcare workers or the vulnerable groups or, or what do you do? And they're then individual policy decisions that governments have to decide on. Yeah. And and I guess Jen, to, to, to further your points that uh, were already well made, um, what is it going to take to get um, you know some form of of manufacturing capacity uh, up here in Australia um, to you know if if there was an opportunity for a vaccine, even if we if we found one here, how long and what would it take to to get that happening? It, so it is a bit of a, a piece of string question. Um, I mean, there's. On one level, you can you can talk about bricks and mortar and what it takes to build a factory, and you can uh, we looked into this for influenza, in fact, and and we've you know you can find factories from 50 million to half a billion, and the difference in cost will depend on um, the technology that's being used, but in particular that the people, the quality systems, um, the people that understand all the various um, analytical processes, process development, and all the quality control that that comply with regulatory. Um, so I guess what will it take in Australia? One, um, some, as I mentioned, some kind of evaluation of where we can strategically invest in something that makes sense is going to perhaps make a regional supply hub feasible. So it's absolutely clear that um, a factory's got to be sustainable and it's therefore got to have a big enough population to have demand and, and the Australian population is relatively small. So the first thing is thinking carefully about what it is we invest in and a technology that um, is valuable with, with potentially broad use in the region. The second is the, the bricks and mortar component, and that will probably take for these types of in emerging infectious diseases where um, you know, the business model's not very compelling for private sector investment. It will either take government money or it will take some kind of public-private partnership. And there have been um, conversations um, at multiple levels in government, uh, Commonwealth government about, um, you know, global health funds and, and that type of thing in Australia. I, I think it would be great if those um, discussions continue and, and we're very fortunate that we have um, the chair of CEPI, Jane Holton, based in Australia. So I'm sure those conversations are continuing. And then thirdly, um, there's a huge skills gap. Um, there's obviously a, a lot of great people working in pharmaceutical industry in Australia, but for the most part, with the exception of 
a small handful that are in manufacturing. We don't have a lot of expertise in manufacturing, process development, quality control, uh, and all the things that you need um, to have a vaccine facility, for example. Securus clearly do. Um, GSK, mm. I think, have some local fill finish capability, but, but we need more skill uh, and training people. So I often feel like there should be some targeted migration um, program to get uh, regulatory and quality and manufacturing people here. It's no doubt everyone wants to live here, so we should use that to our advantage. Um, and I think this is probably another one Another one for you, Jen. Um, um, has Medicines Australia been brought in on the need for the increase in vaccine manufacturing from our Oceania region? Um, I'm pretty sure they have. So, so Medicines Australia has been quite active in um, discussions, both, both with all of the um, heads of companies that are members of Medicines Australia, but also with government about supply chain sustainability. And in fact, they were planning event on, on a, a topic similar to this, which I think will probably be rescheduled as a webinar soon. So certainly the discussions are, are ongoing and, and active. I'm, I'm not privy to all of them. Um, but I guess the challenge for everyone is, is the starting point, which vaccine candidate is going to be uh, the one to invest in. And, and as Gary said, probably there needs to be multiple. And maybe these kind of conversations need to happen globally and regionally so that there can be strategic solutions in, in multiple places in the world. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree. Look, um, guys, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, Gary, Jenny, Jenny, <laughs> two Jennies. Um, look, it's been it's been fabulous. And I think I think what it's saying to us is that the the measures that we're taking currently um, in in our, our clinical activities uh, need to be uh, I guess focused around what we can do to ensure that we can continue doing the activities that we're doing in probably uh, a, a, an ongoing way, a, a ongoing isolated way um, into the future. Um, I don't see a vaccine coming here from what I've heard um, in the near, near term, uh, unfortunately. So I think, I think we're gonna have to utilize strategies and embed you know, a lot of these changes into the way we do things um, and, and also get that national focus around what we can do to, to build the, you know, appropriate capacity to you know, look at a whole range. This is a, this is a pandemic, but there will be others, um, and and probably more in the future. So I, I do think we need to get down and think about that, um, and those facilities that that you know are not going to be financially viable from a from a, um, a commercial perspective, but is is an in an absolute you know essential need for a, for a country um, isolated like Australia. So look, guys, thank you so much for the presentations um, today, um, and also thank you so much. Um, to uh, uh, MTP Connect, uh, to uh, Queensland and to New South Wales Health uh, for their support during these pro through these programs. Um, and um, honestly, uh, it's it's great that that we've got that support because you know supplying these uh, events for free uh, it, it just wouldn't have been commercially viable for us either. So look, um, th uh, thank you guys. Um, next week um, we're hearing not not that it's the last thought that we had uh, about patients, but um, it's really about that concept of, of patient centricity in trials. And we're gonna be hearing from um, um, patients like we heard uh, on Wednesday, last Wednesday from um, Professor Ian Chubb, um, who t spoke to us not as you know an ex-Australian uh, uh, chief scientist, but as a patient who was a, uh, a very grateful recipient of a clinical trial um, here in Australia. So. Um, we, we're hearing from um, patients uh, in the last of our series, but again, as I said, not 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 our last thought. Uh, it was just planned that way. So thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to our speakers, and uh, look forward to catching up with you again next week, if not before. Thank you.